Well, hello there, my brothers and sisters. It's Josh Packard. Welcome to another episode of the Golden Image of Churchianity is a Lie. Thank you for joining me today. If this is your first time, welcome. And if this is your first time, I want you to know right off the bat, um, you don't die to go to heaven. You you live to go to heaven. Okay. I want to show you the, the difference in changing your mindset from what you've been told and, and what the truth is. See, if you die, you die. You don't go to heaven. It's, it's someone who's dead cannot live in heaven. Someone who's alive has to live in heaven, right? And I don't want to talk about heaven in the way that we think because you don't go to heaven in any sense. It's actually the kingdom of heaven is manifested from us because it resides in us. So everything that we're, we're taught to do is to do things to either go to heaven or go to, or, or we're going to go to hell or whatever is going to happen or, or annihilation, depending on who you are. Um, and that, that is an absolute lie and it's a distraction from the truth. Um, you were alive once in, in Adam and Eve back before they fell and to make a long story short, what, what was the result of them in their their own judgment and their own idea because of the introduce, being introduced to sin, um, what that happens is, is they just separated themselves from God. Okay. And so that anything that was been, has been born from God has been, has been born to die because of Adam. Right. So you're, you're born dying because when you were born, you were born in death. You were born in death and dying. And that's, that's where, where everything's going. So you would, you would, you know, cease to exist uh, once once you uh, you've expended the life that was allotted to you at birth, right? So <clears throat> you would you wouldn't go to hell and be tormented forever and ever. That's that's not what would happen. Somebody alive would would have to you know what I mean. In order to be tormented forever and ever, it means you have to be alive forever and ever, right? Because we are not eternal beings. The only way that we are eternal is if we are reconnected back to God as our source of life. And then we would we would take his duration, quality, um, his character. We take all parts of his life by merely being connected to him. So then as a result of the fall, people look to carnal things and observations as to whether men are righteous or unrighteous. And people who are worthy of heaven or hell because of the things they do. Um... That's why Christ had to come and wipe out all of your sins so that no one could point to anything external for being evidence of anything, whether you're going to go up or down. It has nothing to do with outward deeds. It has everything to do with Christ's deeds. So if Christ is overcome, if he is, if he has done what he was forecast to do, um, or prophesied, whatever word you want to use, if he has done those things, then everything's been reconciled. Because in Adam, all died. All, all men became sinners because one man sinned. But whereas the sin has abounded unto all men, grace will superbound that, right? So grace has to go as at least as far as sin has spread, right? But we know the power of grace that it is much, much stronger and infinitely, infinitely more stronger. So we know that it'll surpass anything that could have, sin could have taken, right? So your, your choice is this. You can have your denomination, you can have your church, your religion, your philosophy, whatever it's going to be, but you're still going to be in death. You can be right you, according to your own estimation. You can have your arguments. You can have whatever. You can have your satisfaction of that you have never been swayed. And it's you've stuck your way to your truth, but you're still dead and you will die. Apart from Jesus, you will never come back. You would never come back. Just so you know, you would just go into death. Your children, everything you've ever loved and known, every animal that you've ever loved, everything will go into death. Everything will be forgotten. It's all futile. Everything is futile. And then you'd have to know that in your brain. And you, you have to keep yourself shuttered from that. You have to keep yourself in cognitive dissonance because that is the ultimate reality that you face whenever you are separated from God and you are left to your own devices and to the duration of your soul power and energy it is it is going to be gone it, it will deteriorate it's going to die you have no hope period but for those who uh, of us who have reconnected to god we can tell you how it happened we can tell you it's because we saw jesus we saw what he did 
we have agreed with him that his blood was right and enough. We're not trying to add to it. We're not trying to promote stumbling blocks for ourselves and others and, and giving ladders and rungs for things that people must accomplish in order to receive what has been freely given to them. We don't do that. We're not of the religious circle. We're not Christians. I mean, we are really. In, in truth, we are Christians, but more adequately, we are the sons of God. Okay? We're not just Christians, like the way that we think Christians are. And Christians are really just, they're just, they're going through motions. They're good people, don't get me wrong. I don't hate any Christians because Christians are great. I'd love to have Christians as my neighbors. I'd love to have Christians as my friends because they're good people and they won't steal from you. And they, well, I mean, I mean, in a perfect world. I mean, um, but again, good and evil does nothing for the conscience. And in the conscience is where the battle is fought. And if in your conscience you are still aware of external observations, and let me give you this test, and I know it is going to get old for you guys to hear it all the time, but again, when I look to, to say Hitler, and I go, you know what, Hitler's absolutely saved, he'll be with you in heaven. And your first reaction will be, but he did this, this, and this, and this, and this, and he didn't repent, and there's no record, da 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 and you're going to go right into this mental gymnastics as to why he is not saved. Well, did you even look at Jesus even for one second? Did you take into consideration what his blood has done, what his suffering, what is what he's done on that cross? Did you even take a look at him? And chances are, and I mean, I mean, I'm saying 100 percent, not just I'm just saying that as kind of a, you know, to lessen the blow. But if you're pointing to him and his works, uh, being Hitler's, uh, for whether or not he is saved, then in your own heart of hearts, you have to look at yourself that way. Because you're still admitting there's a measuring system as to who can enter the kingdom of heaven. People that believe, accept, repent, believe the way you do, blah, 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 blah. I mean, these, these people, this is your litmus test. And that judgment is a judgment according to the law. When you have not died under the law. So you're still measuring yourself, your others, you're, you're measuring your children, you're measuring everybody by that same thing. And the problem is, is no one measures up, not even you. So you can never have the confidence that you are the son of God or a daughter of God. You can't do that. You can't believe that God loves you because he is love. That he's pleased with you because Jesus paid your price and has made you pleasing. That you've been presented holy and without blame before him in love. That you are now a child of God. That you're not a sinner. That you're a saint. You haven't received these things yet. Because they're only for the receiving. You can't earn them. You can't do anything for them. It has to either been given to you in its entirety or not at all. You are either 100% perfect and entire, lacking in nothing in the eyes of God. Or you're in your own mind, you are inadequate and you cannot enter that way. See, the kingdom of God is entered through comfort and peace and trust and hope and joy, thankfulness and gratefulness. These things are what, what keep you, it not only enter you, but keep you. And the only way you can be thankful is to a God who has absolutely done everything on your behalf. Otherwise, you can say, oh, well, thank you for giving me the opportunity again to be annihilated. And then you get to the experience of those in the, in, in the, end, of, in the end of the book, in Revelation. So you see when people raises the, the evil from the dead, right? So the resurrection of the just and the unjust, right? Uh, at the, at there at the, towards the lake of fire. And, and you're going to see, in, in your heart of hearts, do you believe that God... So he's either going to annihilate these people or throw them into hell for eternity, right? Well, we know that he's not going to throw them into hell for eternity because death and hell get cast in like a fire. Uh, so like a fire is neither death nor hell, right? So, so then death could be annihilate or fire could be annihilation because it could burn away anything that's natural. And if somebody was separated from God, they would be natural, right? They'd have to be annihilated. But then that would mean that God raised them. So, so he, they went into death and they were annihilated, right? They were dead already, right? So he raises them up from the dead again and then he annihilates them again after he judges them. Does that make any sense to you on any level? I mean, honestly. I mean, in order to believe that people are going to go to hell or be annihilated, you have a level of cognitive dissonance that is astounding. I mean, honestly, after being presented with that, with that knowledge. It, it makes no sense. And then the, the bride is the bride in the New Jerusalem always appear after the lake of fire. 
showing that the lake of fire is instrumental on making that bride. And then you combine that with verses where, you know, God's righteousness is a consuming fire. Jesus baptized with a fire. Every man's work shall be tried by fire. What man it shall be, you know, if that man suffers loss, he himself shall be saved. But as through fire, I mean, everywhere you look, the fire is, is righteous. And again, the fire is not down. The lake of fire is not down. Where does fire always come from in the scriptures? It comes down. God comes down in fire on top of Mount Sinai. The, the, the bush that's on fire is, is a picture of Jesus and the church. You, you have Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego going in the fire, and there's, there's someone in the fire with them. Who is that? It's not Satan, right? It was Jesus. We keep, we keep attributing things um, to Satan that are like for the, Jesus is the author of. Jesus is in the fire, not Satan. You know, Jesus is the one with a pitchfork in his hand. Satan doesn't have a pitchfork. The devil, you always see the pictures of the devil with a pitchfork. That is not Satan. I mean, that is Jesus. Jesus is the one that carries the pitchfork. He's the one that winnows. He is the one that separates the wheat from the chaff. He is. So, uh, you know, my friend Nate the other day called, and he's talking about how, you know, he, he, he's come to the, real, the realization that, that the whole battle is in the mind, that it's everything that we're doing is trying to change people's mindset to, so that they can see directly from the correct position so that they're no longer tossed to and fro but they're they're fully grounded in Jesus so the battle isn't just it isn't calling people sinners and warning them about going to hell because if you're doing that you're antichrist anyway because Christ has defeated death and hell and he's annulled it so if you're still warning people of it you're saying Christ didn't do anything you're telling people that if they have to be saved, if, if they believe and accept and repent, then they'll be saved. But the truth of the matter is you were saved that you would believe. You, you have to first be saved in order to even believe because otherwise you're disconnected from God and dead. The only God you can conceive of is the one that is pretending to be Jesus in this world being Satan. Anyway, I just want you to know and show you the futility of everything you've been taught that you're absolutely reconciled to God and you always have been from the seventh day. I mean, honestly, when God sat down and, and rested from everything he created and made. See, created, was, we see creation, but the thing that is made is going to be the, the New Jerusalem, the entirety of mankind with the plan that he has put into place like an architect. That is when it's completed and he sees it from the end, from the beginning, and he sees very good and you're in that. You just got to remember, you're in the middle of construction in your opinion, you're so so God is is a builder of eternal dwelling places, and you are not. You can't look at God's construction technique and critique it. Because he is building something that is so foreign to you, <clears throat> you wouldn't even know the beginning. Whether to judge so even in yourself, he has, he has made you perfectly and wonderfully as you are. You're in a plan. You're in a process. He sees the end. He says it's very good. Wherever you're at right now might be bullshit. might suck. But the fact is, is that is a building block to get you to the perfected man that he has made you to be. So don't look externally. You have to trust in the author and the finisher of your salvation. The one who, who washed us in his own blood and made us kings and priests while we're enemies to him. You guys got to understand Everything was done. God, Jesus, the reason why he even went to the cross is so that he could be handed over by both the Jews and the Gentiles. So that no man may boast that everyone was com complicit in his death, burial, his death and his burial. We all were. Everyone. To this day, because we side with Satan, that we look like if you're looking outwardly at the world versus the church, they look at their, like they're enmity with each other, correct? So the world calls the church hypocrites. And the, the, the hypocrites or the church calls them uh, sinners so that are going to go to hell. And both are judging on external ideas. So when you step back and you look at, at the battle that God is in and what he is after, you're seeing that they are sided with the enemy, not realizing it, the church system and, and the world. They both don't realize they're serving Satan. And the fact that they judge according to their outward observations. And the test, again, is just consider whether or not... Uh, well, let's put it even further, that Satan will be reconciled 100%. He already is, positionally, but he will be reconciled in the end. He will bow and confess. And everybody's going to go, well, no, he's an enemy. He's this, he does this, and da, 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 da. He's the father of all lies. He's evil, blah, blah, blah. Again, who do you point to, him or Jesus? Who's more powerful, him or Jesus? 
For you, who's more powerful, Satan or you or Jesus? Who's the most powerful? So then if if the one who is the most powerful, the King of kings and Lord of lords, we have to take what he has said to be true, right? You have to deny. So by faith, you believe him. Even though everything outside of you looks like a shit show. Even though the works that are being done from you and the evil things that you're doing, you've got to look away from those and you've got to trust because the more you put your faith and the more you trust in Christ and the more you receive of him and his righteousness, the more you are transformed into his very image. All your efforts are trying to beat yourself up. You have to focus on your sins and iniquities in order to empower yourself to change. These are called workers of iniquity, and these will have no part. You've cast out demons in his name. You've done all these things in his name. And Jesus says, depart from you, you worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. And that's that's the truth, because you're not allowing yourself. You're still covering yourself in hypocrisies and lies. You're not manifesting the truth to Christ. You're pretending to be something, and you cannot fellowship with him nor with other people. And that's why you're so lonely. That's why the... Why no, you don't, in any relationship, you don't feel any connection. You don't feel any transference of life because you're a hypocrite pretending. So, so even though you're among a thousand people, you don't, you feel alone. So the, the converse effect of that is to be shut. First of all, everybody makes a man of sin. So from a, being a child, you have put on a persona, one that, um, that gets pats on the back to the maximum as much as you can get, and the one that 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 doesn't get made of made fun of in your opinion uh, to the max. You know what I mean? So you're you're trying to present the most palpable version of yourself, not only to yourself because you really don't want to see what you really are, but also to the world in order to get by and to to feel as though you fit in, right? But if we look through the so then so then no matter what. Because everyone's doing this, we we are empty, alone, and we are oppressed because we cannot have the refreshing that comes from fellowship. And fellowship is not hanging out one with another. It is to, I mean, maybe it could be a little bit, it could be an aspect, but but it is to absolutely be unclothed from everything that you've created yourself to be. To be completely unclothed back to God's original intention of what he made you to be. And then be empowered through comfort and holiness and peace and joy to maintain that man whom God has created in his perfect image. The one that is made after Christ. So this person God can use. And now you being unshucked from your old man, you now meet what you were intended to be. And then you manifest the glory of God through the man that he created you to be. But you'll only do this if your conscience is clear and you have the whole armor of faith on the helmet, the you know the breastplate, the, I mean shod, and you know everything that you every all that those pieces of armor need to be in place so that you you'll be able to quench the fiery darts of the enemy and the adversaries and the people that will mock you and to tell you tell you you're going the wrong way and all these other things. You you need to put on faith in order to be able to withstand because if you present that false hypocrite to somebody. And that, that hypocrite is rejected. You can still say, ha ha, you didn't hurt me. You missed me, bitch. Right? Because you, you that is not really you. And it, and it doesn't hurt so bad. I mean, it's it's like somebody making fun of you. The house you built is one thing. And that is that is humiliating, but not as bad as them making fun of you. Right? So once this, this, this puppet that you put out is absolutely obliterated, now it's literally you raw and exposed. And until you receive Christ's righteousness and the strength of the Holy Ghost, you will be you'll live in fear because it really hurts for this person to be rejected, especially the first time the real you is being first of all, you've had the balls to actually present yourself as you are in complete vulnerability, and then you're gonna get attacked right off the bat. And then once you do that, you it the first time is scary and it hurts because it's literally you and it's humiliating. But then you are you truly learn to have no confidence in your flesh and your righteousness comes completely from the lord because you have no other way because you're just you 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 refuse to put forth the hypocrite so you're not using your shields anymore you're using the lord's it's pretty awesome but when you do that now you can genuinely um fellowship one with another and with God. And so whenever you fellowship with God, it's the reconnection. And the actual transference of his life unto you is called fellowship. 
And then we, as brothers and sisters, then we also connect. And so then we, so there, each one of us is connecting to God and then connecting to each other in fellowship. And so we're, we're creating this power grid of God's life that will overspread the globe. Uh, and I mean, beyond, of course, I mean, all of creation. But in, in, sorry, guys, if you don't think that Earth is a globe or flat Earth or whatever, I don't care, it, whatever. Um, it doesn't affect me. I think it, there's strong evidence for both. I still think the geocentric model actually works best to satisfy all of my <clears throat> my uh, questions that, that are not answered in the flat Earth model. But, um, but there's, anyway, we'll go about that as another day. But I don't, you know, you guys know that I support you and I don't think you're crazy. I think you have some very, very good arguments that led me to see, seek out other things, you know. But anyways, folks, this is how the glory of the Lord it will be manifested from the sons of God. And everything is waiting for us to manifest. All of, all the powers and principalities, all the fallen angels, all of creation is groaning in travail, waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. And we are being revealed right now. So, anyway, um, that being said, I was reading, uh, I'm reading through uh, Second Kings right now. And every time I come to Naaman the leper, Naaman the Syrian, uh, who's, you know, I don't think... That's not it. He would not have been identified as a leper. That wouldn't be his his first. Because in my Bible it says the cure of Naaman the leper, and I don't think that he'd be identified as a leper. He was a very quality person, and we'll get into this right now. But I always want you to see that there's this uh, that God interacted with people throughout Scripture that were not just Hebrews. The Hebrews are the oracle. These are, they're the people whom God has chosen in order to reveal Himself through. This is, this is what's cool about it. But there were many, 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 many other people that have known God throughout history. And I want you to see that it's not about being a Jew or a Christian in itself. It's, it's about knowing God that matters, right? And, and having his life. So um, let's just go through the story of Naaman. Um, again, I just, I did a, I did a, I, I've done a, a video on him before because he's so amazing. But this, every time I come through it, I can add something to it because it's, it becomes much more profound and it's very big. Okay, now Naaman, the captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given him deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. Well, there's a lot in that 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 thing, that statement right there. But the thing is, is that by him the Lord had given him great deliverance. So the Lord fought with Naaman. Really strange, right? And it says that he was a great man with his master. He was honorable. Um, so so uh, he was a man of valor, but he was a leper. So he, he, this man was upstanding in all of his ways. I mean, so much so that it, you'll see that it's the way his servants urged him and pleaded with him because they, this guy was a loved man. And it, I think it's just interesting. But it's just weird that the Lord, it specifically says the Lord by him wrought great deliverances because the Lord was on this guy's side too. And you're, you're just, you see this all over the place throughout the Old Testament where the Lord pops up and he's, in, he's directly interacting in the lives of these people that have nothing to do with the Hebrews. I mean, even, even enemies sometimes. So, anyway, and the Syrians had gone out by companies and brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were, in the, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his, lep, his leprosy. And this is Elisha. But this is really crazy. This little maid just mentioning this to, to the wife. And, um, but it, it shows the desperation that he was under. I mean, it really does, that he would listen to this little cap, this captive maid, which is strange. And you know the Lord put her there for this purpose. It's, it's pretty awesome to think about. So one went in and told his lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is in the land of uh, that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to go. And I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed, and he took with him ten, ten talents of silver, and six thousand pieces of gold, and ten changes of raiment. So this this Naaman was a very, very important guy, so much so that his master is the one that's giving him all this money and supplies for this. This is crazy. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now then, this letter is come unto thee. Behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my, thy servant to thee, or my servant to thee, that you may recover him of his leprosy. 
And it came to pass, when the king of Israel read the letter, and he rent his clothes and said, Am I God, to kill and to make alive, that this man does send me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, and see how this, how he seeks a quarrel against me. And it was so, that when Elisha the man of God had heard the king and of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Where, What is the reason you have rent your clothes? Let him come unto me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariots and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. So this this part always blows my mind because Elisha was like doing the dishes. So he just sent his servant. He said, he said, uh, said with through his messenger, sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and you shall be clean. But it's just funny because but Elisha was just like, yeah, whatever. He just sent. He just sent another dude over and said, you know, why don't you just tell him to go do this? Did, didn't So Naaman came with pomp and circumstance. He was an important man, and, and, and Elisha's all, whatever. You know, and it's like it was no big deal. You know, it's just really interesting. And But Naaman was angry and went away and said, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of his Lord God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. But see, he went in with all these expectations of what he thought and how he thought God should act, how one of his prophets should act, and how it should be some great, mighty, magical, mystical thing. And Elisha's just like, oh, yeah, just go to the water and dip. And he didn't even say it to him personally. He just said, like, it was no big deal. Just go down to the water and be clean, you know. And that's us. We, we really think that God should require of us some big deal. And I did that. I went all over the world risking my life doing all kinds of crazy shit in the name of you know, trying to know God. And it was really for me to prove to myself that I was really a Christian. And so I went out with, with all this, I went out with absolute, just went and did crazy shit thinking that I was going to impress God or, or I was, you know, or myself or whatever. I, and then God at the end of it, it says, you know, that wasn't for me. That was for you, you know, and God, he doesn't care. It, it's, he thought it was probably pretty funny, but he let me go through it so that I could see one simple thing that all of my works are meaningless. <laughs> That he had already done everything for me. It was before I ever even was ever even born on this earth. That he has absolutely purchased me, redeemed me, washed me, made me a king and priest before I was even aware of it. And I'm because of my iniquity, because I wouldn't believe him, even though he purpose, pur, you know, he told me he loved me, but gave me no direction. I, I had to figure all this stuff out through him, of course. <clears throat> but I want you to know, all I could have done is just hurt him the first time that I was absolutely reconciled, that he saved me, loved me, washed me in his own blood. I could have believed him. I could have believed him and rested from the very beginning if I would have allowed myself to believe him, but I didn't. I had to go and test everything and figure out what everything was and argue with everything and everyone and him, including him, and fight and piss and moan. I mean, every time I see, you know, like whenever Moses is making fun of, or just telling the people of Israel, you know, know that God is not giving you this land because you've done anything. You were rebellious. And he lists, lists all these places where they were rebellious through the whole thing that God did it in spite of your rebellion to get you to here today. And that's what he did to me through all my rebellion, pissing on the pissing and moaning. And it was finally till I can get to this place where I can finally see, you know. But it's just so funny how we have these big delusions of grandeur and, you know, everything we think that God should be doing these amazing things of call fire from out of heaven and, you know, blah, 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 you know and God's just like, oh, nah, I love you. And, and, then you just, and you're like, oh, what? That's it? Well, oh, that's amazing. <clears throat> so, are not Abana and Parfar or Farfar or Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And that's how we are. I could never believe in a God that would do X, Y, and Z. I could never believe in a God that blah, blah, blah. You guys, everybody has all these opinions, and I hear it from people. I hear it from me. I heard it from me. I hear it all the time. I never believe in a God that would support slavery. And I'm like, well, uh, unfortunately, the Bible does not condemn slavery at all. It gives provision for it. So maybe slavery isn't that big of a deal to God. It must, be, it's, But it is to you, I guess. So, I mean, you know what I mean, how people get caught up in all these things thinking God should give a shit about the things they care about. And he doesn't. Kind of like I always talk with my wife, because we're talking about, you know, you know, as 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 women get older and um, 
you know, when they're young, they're they're most valuable on the dating scale and everything else. And it's called, you know, they'll date above themselves. That's called hypergamy, and they they isolate themselves because the more the more escalated they get in their in their lives and all their you know financially and all their job and everything else, well, the smaller their pool becomes because they limit themselves. They won't date anyone down. They'll only try to go up, and it just makes it smaller, smaller, smaller. So um, people people isolate themselves from things because of their opinions and because they think they're they think that so my wife always thinks that I should so we're, if we're walking down the road and you know she'll see some woman that think she'll think oh that girl's very attractive and everything else I'm like no nah, not at all I don't have there's nothing in, I don't think she's that great at all but then someone will come by that I do think is attractive and I'll say well that one is much more attractive and she'll go what she has da, 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 da. well I said the things that are valuable to a man she exudes the other woman does not you know because it's just funny how women get mad at men for not wanting the things women should think they sh- they think they should want them to want, right? We're men. We want what we want. That's the way it is. Women should conform to that if they want men, right? You know, and we want women that are youthful and, you know, haven't had a whole bunch of partners and I mean, you know, these are the things that we value. You know what I mean? We can go through this whole day long and, and tell you that men value completely different things than what women think. We don't give a shit if a woman has a nice job or a, a nice house or anything. We don't care. That it means that's meaningless to us. You guys, I mean, it, it's just funny how, it, it, in any ways, and it applies over into religion that we we think God should want the things that we think He should want, and He doesn't care. That's not what He wants. He wants what He wants. So, in, if we want to be with God, then we've got to go with what He wants, right? It's funny. He doesn't bend over for us. He, God doesn't simp to us. Let's put it that way. Um, so after he left in a rage, it says, And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do something great. And I love how they called him my father. His servants called him my father. If the, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much rather then when he said to you, Wash and be clean. Just, you know, and they're just like, he just told you to do something simple and you're mad about it. You know, and they're talking him down. They're like, please do it. We want to see what's best for you. We want to see you restored. We want to see these things because these people loved him. And they talked sense into him. And this is, this is what, what we as, as a, as a, as priests of Melchizedek, this is what we're trying to do is just talk sense into people. It's not this or that. Just, this is what he said to go do, go do. Simple, easy. Then he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto a f- a fl- the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, and he and all of his company, and came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, now I know there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. And he said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. And that's the that's the exact opposite modus operandi that the church operates under, right? I mean, they'll take your money quick, fast, in a hurry. I mean, they'll suck it up with a straw. I mean, they see a dollar there; it's are on it. It's like a, you know, it's like a, you know, it's just funny. So, um, and Naaman said, "Shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servants two mules?" Burdens of the earth, for thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto the Lord. In this thing the Lord pardon thy servant, then when my master goes into the house of Rimnon to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow myself to the house of Rimnon, when I bow down myself in the house of Rimnon, Rimon, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. And he said to him, Go in peace. So he departed from him a little ways. But Gehazi, the servants of Elisha, anyway, that's he follows after him and, and he goes and gets the reward and then then Elisha puts the uh or I don't know whether it's you know Elisha and God could get together, but it puts that leprosy of Naaman on him because he he went and thought that he could make money of the Lord and off a miracle and off the the healing of that man and the conversion. Anyway, this is such a great story to me, and that that's we all have to take heed that our minds and conceptions, um, though they may be right and there might be good things and you might be wise and you might understand the most complex things, but they don't mean anything. Life is what changes the heart. The heart is where the battle is fought, not the, not the brain, right? 
because there's so many intelligent people. Like, I can I can go down the list. You know, you know, there's John MacArthur. That guy's intelligent. You cannot you. There's no way you can dispute that. He's a very very intelligent man. But because he doesn't use his spirit, God is limited by his intellect. You know, you see that happening everywhere with people in their intellect trying to discern a God that is discerned in the spirit, not the mind. So those who are wise, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And, and so the fear of the Lord, it, it exists in your spirit. You, you, the, your mind, you can, you can do everything you want. You, your mind can be subject to, to what you think God wants. But because you don't have his spirit, you're misled. You might, you, you could preach the, the scriptures with, you know, with power and with, with might, but because you miss the spirit, it doesn't make sense to you. I mean, there's several things like people not knowing that Jesus is God. It's because you're not discerning with your spirit. It's because you're trying to make rational. You're trying to wed arguments. You're trying. You're not even trying. You actually have to just kind of because you see the statements that say that Jesus is the Son of God, right? And you're oh, there he is, the Son of God. Yep, he's the Son of God. Well, then you miss the statements that say he is God also. Well, there's no contradiction that he is both. And it's easy to see, especially in your spirit, because you know that that God cannot be separated from Jesus nor the Holy Spirit. But to you, the Holy Spirit is enigmatic because he's not linked with God. Who is the Holy Spirit and how is the Holy Spirit processed into you unless it was by God uh, being processed into Jesus, into flesh, then taking over all of mankind, earning earning all the right to everything, um, receiving everything back from the dead, I mean, everything that he did was to process himself into you as the Holy Spirit. So you know him as the Father, then the Son, and then as the Holy Spirit. But if you know him as the Holy Spirit, you know him also as Jesus and the Father. But if you have no Holy Spirit, if you don't understand the Spirit and you don't utilize your Spirit, and you're not led by your Spirit, this will be alien for you. And I'm just using this for one argument, or the argument of people going to hell or being annihilated. You know, you, you can look at those things. So going to hell makes no sense, honestly. That that really, once you dig into it, there's no possibility you're going to hell. Hell belongs to death. Death has been abolished. There's no possibility of that. Annihilation, now that makes sense according to, to a mind. Until you get to the verses like we're talking about. To where in Revelation it says that God is going to, he's going to raise up. He's going to bring to life both the, the those that the just and the unjust. He's gonna, those that are written in the book of life and those who are not. He's going to bring them up. Those who are in the book of life... They have one thing that he's going to take those ones that were not written in the book of life and then he's going to take them and just annihilate them again. You know that doesn't make sense because we know God's heart. He created everything. And he, he to him, he's, he's acutely aware of everything that he's created. Even your hairs are numbered. That's how intimate God is with everything. So whether we despise others or whatever or not, it doesn't matter. He's still their father. And he loves them very much. And if he was going to lose one, um, that would be a loss to him. I mean, look at leaving the 99 to go get the one. You guys don't understand. God will not leave his children to be annihilated. The thing that he created, he will not allow to Satan have, not allow Satan to have one. There will be nothing for Satan to glory in. It will be a unanimous and total utter uh, defeat for Satan. If he, can be point, if he can take one from God, that's a victory for him. He'll take it. Two, three, four. The more that are, the more annihilated, the better for Satan. You guys got to understand. You have to discern with your spirit on these things. If God be for us, who can be be against us? He who did not withhold his only Son, how shall he with not with him not give us all other things? You guys got to keep. Who is there to bring any charge against you when it is God who sent His Son? Is He going to condemn you? Or how about His Son that came and died in your behalf? Is He going to condemn you? So if neither Jesus nor God are going to condemn you. Who's there to condemn you? No one. The only, the only, the only ones that are condemning you right now are you and Satan, and anyone who's still underneath the carnal idea of religion, still obeying their ideas of righteousness and good and evil, and their doctrines, and thinking that they're good because they believed. I overheard some old dude and talking with this lady in the gym, talking about how these sinners are going to go to hell, and he's just going through this whole thing, and he's preaching like he's a preacher, and he's just going. Uh, up and down, and this woman is just agreeing with him, and go, oh yeah, my poor children, I've got one that's saved, and the other one's going to hell. And you're just like, oh my god. <sighs> I 
we'd all be going to death if it was not for Christ. And he didn't just save us individually. He didn't just predestinate a few of us to be saved. We were predestined sinners in death because of Adam. Because of Adam, all die because all have sinned. But because of Christ, all shall be made alive, each in his own order. You guys got to see Christ the first fruits. And then we, so he's the prototype. Everything is in his order and timing. Everything has been put under his feet. We do not yet see everything put under his feet. I mean, everything's been reconciled. We do not yet see it reconciled. It's everything has been done. We're looking to that end and bringing it to now. We're looking at that, you guys. Um, since I was th- looking at that, I want to go to um, uh, Hebrews real quick. And, uh, I mean, there's just so much in here. Um, sorry, taking me a second. I got kind of distracted because there was something I really wanted to see. But Hebrews 11, I want to kind of go over this in view of this whole thing and how we see the Lord in, in fellowship and the transference of life and um, how life is the only thing that can transform a man, that can fix a sinner, that can restore a man and, and bring him to life and give him any hope is, is life. Life is the only thing that matters. You can give your child everything that you can. You can give them the entire world. You could conquer the world, hand it to your child, but the child will die. And then everything that you gave was futile. But those of us who are learning how, or who are learning how to overcome death, will be able to give our children the, the actual gift of of reconnection to God and life to where they'll never see death. We have that ability if, if we stick steadfast with the Lord and allow Him to do His work in us. Because I believe we're that generation. You know, I was talking with that. Uh, I was talking with a pastor over the other day, the uh, Seventh Day Adventist pastor, and he he brought up something. And he illuminated me a little bit. But that remember when Jesus was transfigured on the mount, and he, there was Moses and Elijah with him. Um, well, it's talking about two two people. The so Moses saw death, and, and then he was resurrected with Christ. Right. So Moses died. But Elijah never died. So he's talking about two classes, those that died and then are caught up and those who never saw death. And and this is where we're at. And I thought that was pretty cool coming from a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. I mean, this dude was, I mean, further than any pastor I've ever heard. I mean, I was pretty amazed uh, by him. But anyway, I thought that was really cool to think about, that you have the two classes, the one, I mean, not two classes, but the, the people that have not attained unto the, unto the resurrection of the dead and those that did attain to the resurrection of the dead. And it's not, and again, it's not by our faithfulness. It's not by anything. It's by the God, God's timing and His working out of His plan. And we're, I think we're in that la- that final phase. We're in the in the trim and the fixture phase. You know, at the end of this, to where God is absolutely uh, putting the finishing touches on the kingdom right now, so that we will manifest it. And that's that's what's going to happen very shortly, I believe. Because we're looking off, thinking like like before, like you have to die, then you go to heaven, right? But that's not the fact. In order to go to heaven, like we would think, is you have to be living to go there. Because God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. So then, so then the earmark of a Christian or someone who follows the Lord is that they are living and not dying. And that is the ultimate evidence, which I think will cause every knee to bow. Every tongue shall confess. Everything in heaven, on the earth, under the earth, and the seas. Everything will bow and confess, and this will bring an end to everything. This will bring everything back into restoration. Um, the 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 creation was also brought into death with Adam and Eve, and how much more so by the by the because we have not we're not given the you know it says that he was a living soul, that Christ was the quickening spirit. Well, the 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 power that Adam had, we will superabound his power because he, we have the power of God. Right, so if if by the the fall of Adam brought about the death of everything, well, Christ resurrecting as the prototype and tasting death for every man, so it's not necessary for us to go to death anymore. Now we can just live with Him and live on unto eternal life. There's no need. And He says the last enemy to, to conquer is death, and that's for us to conquer that too, just as He did. He never saw a corruption. And then it will never. It will be. It's not necessary for us to even see corruption. We, the whole natural order which we've been accustomed to, where everybody born, they're born, they live a life, then they die. We don't need to do that anymore. 
we, we, we live and are resurrected, quickened while we're walking, and we just go right on into eternal life. Anyway, so I'm running a little late again, but anyway, you hopefully you're with me. I mean, I'm, it's just so funny because the, the viewership of my channel has just gone in the tank, and that's, that's perfect because it, this means that only those whom this is intended for are getting it. Um, and if you're seeing what I am seeing right now, you are blessed beyond blessed because we're actually entering the kingdom. We've actually entered in. We're actually, actually in fellowship handling the word of life. We're actually doing it, yeah. It's just crazy. Now, faith is the substance. So think about um, spiritual versus carnal. carnal. So it, remember we were talking about, uh, was it First John yesterday? <clears throat> How the three that bear witness in heaven and the three that bear witness on earth, but the Holy Spirit is what, what translates between the two of them, right? So faith is the substance. So it faith is proves the reality of the unseen okay faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen for by it elders obtained a good report port through faith we understand the worlds were framed by the word of god so the things which are seen were made not of the things which do appear so the more the reality is what christ has shown us and the thing that we dis, we we discern through our spirit is real Everything else is just a figment, a figment of our minds, according to our paradigms and concepts. As a man, so a man thinks, so he is. You know what I mean? And so it's so necessary that we have to re, re. We have to turn our thinking, repent. Um, there was a movie a while back that I thought was really cool, and it might have been Left Behind, maybe. Um, but it talks about, you know, it goes into Genesis whenever it talks about how whenever they're building the Tower of Babel and God looked down that nothing would be impossible to them. You know what I mean? That they, because as as they were working together and they were one mind and one heart, there was nothing that was impossible for them. And that's why he confounded them because it was through the power of sin and iniquity. So God had to put an end to that. But imagine us now being holy and 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 we see the Lord and we've submitted to him because we've actually seen him. That we are healed of our infirmity, that we've we've entered into life, and now the same thing where where we all of one mind and accord are building God's temple, because they were building a temple for themselves to make a name for themselves, all with one accord, because because that's the consequence of sin that every man tries to exalt one man. Well, we don't do that, okay? Our Lord is underneath us, lifting us up, exalting us above Himself, because that's what any good father would do. Okay. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, <clears throat> by which he obtained the witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet he speaks. So this is really cool. So, by faith, Abel offered unto, unto God a more excellent sacrifice by, than Cain, by which he, was, he, was, he obtained witness that he was righteous. And that's when we point to Jesus' sacrifice as right and as an, as a, as right and enough that we we believe that we are righteous. We live as though we well, I mean, we shouldn't live as though we live in genuine righteousness because we see that Christ has paid all things, that we are reconciled one hundred percent, that we acknowledge His sacrifice. We have no more need to cover ourselves or to pretend to be anything because He has He has wrought the victory for us. Um, and anyways. And then he died. He could have conformed to his brother, but he did not. And the fact that he was murderer, he still testifies because his way was righteous and his brother was not. By faith, this is a big one right here. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And this, this is what's coming for us, I believe. And was not found because God had translated him for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So we have a righteous one and one that pleased God. And, and we, have re, we have received the report that we please God because Christ has been our substitute. That he's imputed unto us his righteousness, holiness, his very identity. That when God sees us, all he sees is him. We are clothed in Christ. Okay? But this big deal is that just receiving that you are pleased of God and quit trying to please Him. 
You already are pleasing to him because of what Christ has done. Your efforts at trying to please a God who is already pleased with you denies his being pleased with you. You spit in his face. Because without faith, it is impossible to please him. So what your faith is, your faith is what Abel offered. You, you testify that God's sacrifice is right and enough. That faith brings testimony that you are righteous. Uh, the righteous man is pleasing to God and is translated. Okay? But without faith, it is impossible to please him. And I'm, I'm saying, if, I mean, actually in your conscience and in reality. Because you're, you're going about to establish like Cain did. You're trying to establish your own righteousness, adding to that sacrifice, saying that I need to help God. I still need to do something because you're not testifying that Christ's sacrifice was adequate. So you are testifying you are unrighteous. The sin has dominion over you because you will not believe that you're pleasing to God nor that you are righteous. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned of, good God, of God of things not as yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. And we enter into Christ as that ark, you guys. And by in doing so, and you see what's going on outside of us, as we enter in, God is able to condemn the world because we are coming underneath, we're coming inside of him. So then you're looking around, and you look at all these people out here, and they're getting hammered right now. They don't even know what sex they are. They don't even know anything. They don't love babies. They don't love families. They don't love anything. Everything that God has given as a blessing, they spit on and despise. All the rules that God has given in order to keep a holy life, they just spit on. And you would think that they would look at those things. And why would I be... I mean, if this book was just written by some sheep humpers back in, this, back in the day, um, why is it that it offends us in every way down to the core? Why? Hmm. You think they would think that, but they don't. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whether he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in the tabernacles with Isaac, or the tents. That's what they're called Hebrews because they traveled around. And Jacob and the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself conceived, received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one as end of him as good as dead, so many as the stars in the sky a multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were the strangers and the pilgrims on the earth. And this is literally what we're doing. They're looking to the completion. They're looking with hope to seeing that God has a plan, that he has got this all worked out. And they have their mind and their eyes set there, not only for all of creation, but for themselves, for everything. And that's why they're settled and grounded and not moved with fear. Okay? I'd being afraid. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. We have now received these promises. Okay. For they that for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country, and truly if they had been mindful of that country from whence they had come out, they might have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared he has prepared for them a city. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be, ca shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. By faith Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith Moses, when he was come, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. 
By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is the invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea, and as by dry land, which the Egyptians trying to do were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab, this is awesome that she's in here, per perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. What shall I have more to say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah. Oh, the daughters of Jephthah, that is a sad one, you guys. Oof. And David also, and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword out of weakness, were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead to life, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings. I think that's pretty funny that cruel mockings are put in here. Because this is true. I mean, being mocked day in and day out is like a constant drip. It's like you're being waterboarded every day, honestly. You don't realize it because it's happening to you all the time and you're just used to it. But whenever you were first, when it first happened to you, it was torture. But now, since your faith is in the Lord and you're clothed in Christ, and He is your hope, your armor protects you now from that. Um, anyway, scourgings and moreover bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. Don't you think it's strange they, they never thought and they never sought to have any wealth or any anybody to follow them or make them to lift them up? Isn't that strange? Isn't that kind of opposite of what our churches are doing? Of whom the world was not worthy. <clears throat> They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. These all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. So, now, they didn't obtain the, <clears throat> the promise, but we're, gonna, we're obtaining that promise now, you guys. It's been available for us. It's been fulfilled. We just haven't laid hold of it yet. And we're, la we're laying hold of it now. I'm just going to re read just a little bit further. Um, because now we're in 12. But I want you to see this. Because looking at the tabernacle and the temple. All three of them. Uh, makes me. I see Christ. I see it easy. I, I see the whole plan laid out. But let's check this out. Wherefore, seeing we are also we are we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And the only place in the in the scriptures where I see the cloud, well, there's two places where God has formed Himself in a cloud outside the tent, you know, but the other time was in the Day of Atonement when God was uh, when He was manifested in the smoke of the incense after the blood was shed before the two cherubims. So that cloud of witnesses, is it was us in that position, in that place, witnessing that that blood was enough. So where two or three are gathered, where two or three, there I am, because we are witnessing that Christ's blood was enough. That we've entered into fellowship. We see the two cherubim of glory sitting on top of the mercy seat, but we also see the two cherubim overshadowing the mercy seat, the two big ones that go from wall to wall, and wing to wing, covered in gold. And, and so we see that everything is, is supplied by the witness. The witness of Jesus and the testimony of his victory is what powers the the life of the temple, you guys. Um, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so, does so easily beset us. And to lay aside that sin means to be sinless, you guys. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Don't, don't. Don't esteem your life and your state of life as any evidence as to whether or not God is pleased with you or not. Receive the word that he is. You, you are a work in progress and God has a plan for you. And he's working it out. Allow him to. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy of that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. 
You have not resisted unto blood striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speak, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as unto children. My de- my son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you are rebuked of him, for the Lord loves those whom he chastens, and he scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons, for what son is he whom the Father chastises not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then you are bastards and not sons. Anyway, b- 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 okay, I'm going to get just a little bit further. Furthermore, we've had the the we've had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? The Father of spirits and live. Life, it's you guys. Life is it. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Okay. Anyway, maybe I'll go through this 12 next time. But anyway, my brothers and sisters, if you're with me this far, um, don't you have a life? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, anyway, I don't care. The, the more I just stand in contrast. I am, there's really, um, there's so many brilliant people that are preaching doctrines over Christ. There's so many people that are really seeking, generally treating the, truly, uh, truly seeking the Lord, but are still bound up in the cares and the worries of the world. They're still being bound up in doctrines and external regulations and thinking they're still sinners and that they can sin. That they, There's so much stuff going on because they're not relying on their spirits. I don't think they have anyone teaching them how to rely on their spirit. So the only way that you can know your spirit is to first be shucked and made completely unconfident in your flesh. So have no confidence in your flesh. So you're not going to be able to stand on your intellect. You're not going to be able to stand on the doctrines you know and, and the people patting you on the back and agreeing with you or the followers that you have. That won't be the evidence. The evidence is that there's peace and joy. That you are not confident. If you still think you're a sinner, that you can sin then you, first of all, have not understood what the cross was about, that you don't know the difference between your sin and your sins, and you don't know the thoughts and intentions of your heart because you have not known your spirit yet. The Holy Spirit is just the spirit of holiness. It's just, it, it's received as the matter, it, so it's generated as you know Christ, as you see what he's done, as you are thankful and grateful and you're being filled with joy, the, the, the vehicle by which that is being done is by the Holy Spirit. And you become adequately aware of him or acutely aware of him as you are shed from your old hypocrite. That there's no more woulda, shoulda, couldas anymore. That you're not, you're not obeying your, your own, um, what do you call it? Your own opinions and ideas of what God should want. Like Cain, you've you've realized that your flesh is nothing. That 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 there is nothing. You don't even know the smallest thing about God's kingdom. So, if you want to serve Him, you have to submit to Him, and then be led by your Holy Spirit. So then, you you can actually have the experience of Philippians three, where it is God all the while energizing your spirit, both the willing to do the things of His good pleasure, because you're no longer compulsed to do anything. Your will is free. You're, you're, everything you do is because you genuinely want to do it. And if you genuinely want to do it, it means you were first of all made for it because you're no longer a hypocrite. You've, you've been made for that and you want to do it. Okay? Then from that position, it is easy to listen to your spirit because you, you clearly go, do I want to do it? And if you'll be quenched in your spirit if you're going the wrong way or doing something wrong. But as long as your spirit does not condemn you, you know you're going the right way. And if your spirit does condemn you, you know that God is bigger than your spirit. So you're, you're literally just, you're, you're just following like, like your, your uh, what do you call him? Your shepherd. You're just letting him lead you to pasture, lead you to shade, lead you to clean water, to lead you to peace and joy and lead you to the kingdom. He'll, he, God says he'll lead you to the, to, the, to the desires of your heart as a promise. But he'll, you can only do that if you're seeking the things you want to do. 
If you're, doing, if you're doing the things you think you should do, you, you will never find anything there. Your heart will never be satisfied. You'll always be doing the things you think you should do, which will bring you no joy. All right, that's enough. You guys, God bless you. And we'll talk again soon.